everybody. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome back. I am super excited to welcome to the show the CEO of Pride Media, the editorial director of The Advocate, the author, all-around boss, Diane Anderson Minshaw. <laughs> Hi, Diane. Welcome to Pride, the podcast, and thank you for coming to play with us today. Oh, my God. I love it. I love you all. Yes. yes. It is so wonderful <laughs> for you to be here. And before we like jump into it, where are you located at right now? I'm right now in rural Idaho. Wow. I, 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 yeah, it's actually like, so right now we split our time between rural Idaho and California out in Palm Springs. But, um, but we've been caretaking family members in rural Idaho and not the great part of rural Idaho either. Like, I, was I mean, say. it's very beautiful, but yeah, we're the leading state in the anti-trans legislation right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we're politics or, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. definitely going to get to that, especially, you know, we're all from Texas. I'm from a small town in Texas. Um, so I know all about being in rural. those places that yes. are beautiful. Mm -hmm and have some great people some places and little yeah parts, but we're on a it. we're like on a farm that's like 10 minutes away from the nearest town and that town has a population 800. wow oh, wow so, like, yeah just us so, yeah. Yeah. so i'm four hillbilly now i'm like 100 hillbilly yeah <laughs> <laughs> All I think of is the Beverly Hillbillies, and I love it. <laughs> so, Diane, we're going to jump into it. Tell us, tell us how you came to be. Tell us how your life basically got started into everything that you've been start doing. Start from birth. Yes, start from birth. <laughs> so you were born and... <laughs> <laughs> I was a failed child actor. Seriously, not even a joke. And um, I got to... I went to visit my grandmother and aunt in Idaho. I'd been in, in Southern California as a child and bouncing between... I was one of those, it takes a village to raise kids. Yeah. So I was bouncing between family. And then I, I went to Idaho and um, and I was so in love with it that I was like... And, you know, I was like, oh, maybe I can stay here. And I literally was watching TV and a friend of mine came on the TV show Three's Company. Like she had gotten a little blonde girl. Like I have like brunette curly hair normally. Mm. I was darker as a kid. And so a little, a yet another one of my little blonde friends got a role on like network TV. And I was like, that's it. I'm never acting again. No. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I was like 12. And, um, <laughs> but I was going, so our town that I was in, I, I, in Idaho, it's called Payette, Idaho. And so that's my hometown. And um, I was walking around and they had a newspaper office and a printing press. So I went to the printing press because I love printing presses and mm -hmm. a stepfather of mine had been a pressman. And so I asked him if I could intern there for free, basically like just volunteer and do anything. And they said, no, we don't have girls here. <laughs> so I um, was Come like, uh, wow, what? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> F you. And then <laughs> went to the, um, the newspaper office and we had, um, surprisingly, because this is the early 80s, we had a female editor there. And, um, and she was like, okay, yeah, you know, and so I got to like piddle around and do stuff. And then after knowing her, after going to school for a year, she gave me a column, like it was a youth school column. And I just, you know, moved on from there, basically, into journalism. It was like from there on, from 12 on, that was it. So, wow. yes. um, so yeah, and then I was in mainstream media. I tried everything, sort of like I did TV. I was too fat. And, um, and then, I mean, like, literally, that's what they told me. I was too fat at 140 pounds. And, uh -huh. um, and then, so I was like, oh, that's not it. And I did radio and I was like, oh, that's not it. And, uh, but I always loved magazines. I got my first thing published in, in Highlights Magazine when I was very little. And then oh, wow. I got a, a piece in Teenage Magazine, my first print piece in Teenage Magazine. And Jane Pratt was like the associate editor I dealt with there. So nice. I was like, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> so I went into mainstream media and was in New York working at an agency that would send me to different magazines. So I would go to like uh, New York Bride and be there a couple weeks. And then I would go to Details and be there a few months. And so you wow. would just go to different magazines and learn the biz in this sort of temp fashion. Um, and then I decided to come out. And after I came out, I discovered LGBTQ media or queer media and ACT UP at the same time because all my friends were dying. And um, so ACT UP turned to Queer Nation. I joined LGBTQ media and like basically was like, this is it, I'll never leave. So I freelance for, you know, outlets like, you know, New York Times and bigger magazines and 
Esquire and stuff, but, um, but my whole career after that um, was queer media. That's amazing. So, uh, I I yeah. Started yeah. Girlfriends Magazine in 93, 94, went from On Our Backs to Girlfriend, starting Girlfriends Magazine in 94. Uh, went from that to starting Alice. After that, went, joined Curve, which had been our competitor. Um, oh, but I wrote that. for Curve's second issue. So uh, lesbians, we keep our friends and enemies close. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I had a wonderful, wonderful time at Curve. It taught me uh, it so much. And uh, I was going to take, a, after we sold Curve, um, I was very close to the publisher and I was just like, okay, it's time for me to go too. So I was going to take a little sabbatical and we were driving around in this little um, partially solar powered 1969 Dodge right way motorhome, And it broke down like every seven miles across. And, you know, we were like, we're going to go across the country. Basically we made a salt and sea. So from like <laughs> Portland. So um, oh. it broke down all of the time. But when I was there at salt and sea, we got a call from the CEO at, um, what was then here media, Paul Colickman, and he was like, hey, would you like a job? So that's how I first joined The Advocate. And um, when I was doing the interview with uh, Matt Breen at The Advocate, you know, he was like, I'd like to bring you on. And after he offered me a job, he said, oh, by the way, the editor who does this, the, the executive editor who does this also is the editor in chief of Plus Magazine. So you just do that too. You know, like in your right. spare time. Right. And, um, and Plus is like, you know, the, the most widely read magazine for people living with HIV. And so that brought me back all around to my um, AIDS activism and HIV activism and, um, and that. So, and so I've been like, you know, moving in that world of HIV anti-criminalization efforts and the U equals U movement, stuff like that, and sort of dovetails. And I kind of went from there. So five years ago, I left Here Media, started my own agency, and we contracted with Here Media. So we were producing Plus Magazine and then Advocate Magazine, and then they were like, "Hey, would you like to produce Out Magazine?" And and uh, and but they, you know, Pride Media had, had such turmoil and two, uh, and and uh, let's just say a CEO who did a very poor job with it. That kind of uh, you know burned a lot of people and employees did did poorly by employees. Um, and so after the, the last uh, two CEOs, the owner called me and said, hey, how'd you like to be CEO? And uh, I knew it was sort of a glass cliff moment, but I was willing to jump and find out because, you know, first indigenous CEO, first woman CEO, like, you know, uh, being the first, I got to give it a try. So we change a lot of things about the company. The company is super diverse. The company is uh you know less hierarchical and more collaborative i think and yeah. um that's so yeah that's awesome well, can Great i stop talking about myself i feel wow i mean i was in yeah. awe i mean she i was I, she went there. right yeah. like just name all the accolades i love so it. iconic yeah. carrie bradshaw could never <laughs> <laughs> and just like that yeah no, so right. <laughs> I, I i'm really really inspired by you i i think really it's hitting home you know obviously we are all familiar with pose and they definitely touched on um how the hiv aids uh pandemic affected them mm -hmm. um and it's just so beautiful. And, that and now it's so, really yeah, those act up scenes yeah. on Pose, they were so, like, there was one of them where I was like, I was there, I was there, was you there, know, like, yeah. they were so telling and moving. And uh, I love that kids today are, like, discovering it for the first time, you yeah. know? Yeah. That's why it was so beautiful. And for someone like yourself who was there to watch that and be like, I was actually a part of changing history. And from someone who is young and, and queer, I just wanna say thank you for all the efforts that you've done for us. Because I mean, we stand on your shoulders to hopefully continue to make this world a better place. And mm -hmm. you know, we've been terrified in the past hmm, five, six years, I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, Quite some time. And, and, and it's, you know, especially as a person of color as well, like we keep, you know, we take a few steps forward and a few steps back. So yeah. again, thank you to you and everyone who was with you on the front lines for us and may we continue Continue to move onwards and upwards. Mm. Oh my God! Yeah, absolutely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so much. Your generation is so awesome in that you guys do not put up with shit. Uh, you guys, I don't have any time. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a watch. I don't have any time. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like we have, you know, when the Me Too movement started, I had a, a number of times where I was like, oh, "Are you white?" say we wouldn't put up with that like in the 80s there are all these things where I was like oh well you just had to be one of the boys and you had to 
you know, in order to succeed in this, you had to do, like, I have this thing where I was like, I did everything the boys did. So if they drank two martini lunches, I drank two martini lunches. I did nothing. Really but you would just do everything the boys did to make sure you could be there. We had so many, like, meetings and strip clubs and, uh, you know, stuff like that, that mm -hmm. nowadays there's, you know, like, no woman would put up with that. So now when I hear women who are like, you know, he did this and when I put it, I'm just like, oh my God, should I have done that sooner? Like, is, would I have kept my job or would I, you know, like, am I a sellout that I didn't do that? But so I just love that your generation is just like, yeah, no. And we're Martha not Stewart had talked about um, in a recent interview how she was, she worked in finance and Wall Street and would go to work in hot pants and shorts and just mm -hmm. be one of the boys, like you said, and that's just what you did back then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, how I mean so much, even the stuff with like Cuomo, I'm just like, you know, I'm yeah. like the, the crackdown, you know, it's like, it's so great. It's all coming forward. But we expected that all the time, you know, the grazing, oh. the brass, the like, you know, kissing you. And if you said no, then everything was fine. You know, that was like not even sexual harassment. That was just oh. like, you know, normal. Was, I'm just right. finding out if you like me and if you don't, if I persist, then it's sexual harassment. You know, like we had that kind of a attitude so well, well since you bring it up mm -hmm. i want to know i want to hear your thoughts on this whole cuomo scandal scandalo. <laughs> yeah because now he's denying everything everything yeah. denying. well it seems to be the deny everything is the is the thing i think there's a fine line and i what i will say is that cuomo's a little older than me i think but we're of the same generation and what i think is that what our generation thought was acceptable is not acceptable you know right. and it's no longer acceptable so you know you can go back and look at at different things and they're you know like maybe 30 years ago people were like you know we just shine that on that's just what it is or whatever and he can be like i'm like that with everybody you know but the deal is it's no longer okay to be like that with everybody you right. know if you right. can show us all the celebrity photos you want it's still no longer okay to do that so that's just the minimal of the cuomo allegations i mean obviously he's digging in he doesn't want to resign uh you know that's that seems pure cuomo to me you know but um <laughs> yeah. i don't know that that's like you know the best answer for him so. I, yeah no because now it just makes him look more Sus. Sus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good. I mean, yeah, it. yeah. You look clueless. You know, like take mm -hmm. it, man. At least come out and be like, you know, that, you know, that that used to be okay. It's not okay, and I'm recognizing that. I'm, you know, whatever. Do your rehabilitation tour. I'm getting help. Blah blah blah. He could have saved himself that way because people buy that apology tour up all the time, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I just assume it's a the you know, right. I assume they brought in their publicist who outlined how to do an apology tour and all that. The baby, oh, God, you can't like, even. Yeah. Which it leads like us to yeah, the baby that's going on right now with his. Ignorance. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Do you not think his publicist was like on the phone forty times that night, being like, "Oh my God." You think the baby sat down and wrote out that little well thought out letter? Like that doesn't sound like the guy. Right that. <laughs> but here, here's what I do that. think, though. I do believe the first uh, apology that came out, which was misspelled, oh, I was, gonna and <laughs> was um, and, and that's not even no shade, but just be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. And Done then quick, it was probably. also very much like, oh, sorry about my misinformation about HIV, LGBT, y'all know what's up. That was written by him, <laughs> and that yeah. was said by him. I yeah. think the moment, obviously, after he continued to get canceled from all the festivals and replaced with Ryder Rich Hayes, yeah, yeah. we might play his music today, I don't know. <laughs> right. uh, give yeah. him a shout out. But, you know, moments Roddy Rich was like, I love the LGBT, they ain't done nothing to me. <laughs> he was like, he, he, he was, I'll do he it. was like, hey, right. I'll do He'd it, I love y'all. And now I love everybody It's like, I'll replace him, I'll replace him. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it's interesting. And do, do you feel like these situations, though, with Cuomo and obviously with the baby and other things, have they been politicized? Because I do feel like that as far as the Democrat and Republican, the Democrats do have to, you know, I'm glad that they're calling him to the mat and they're like, hey, you're yeah. wrong. You need to resign. We don't want to replace you. Because well, look, the Democrats are always better at calling our people on shit. Yeah. Yeah. That is the yeah. bottom line. Al Franken, you think the Republicans, you think an Al Franken would ever have resigned in the, if he oh. were in the Republican Party? No, no. way. You, would you know, there's no, no way. Like, 
President Trump, like, admitted sexual harassment repeatedly, said it was fine. Yeah. People back him up. So, again, Democrats, we call, you know, we call out our people a lot faster than Republicans, for one thing. Mm -hmm. But with all of these cases, you have to look at, like, what's there. There is going to be an anti-New York City bias that's working against Cuomo. There's a racism working against a baby. Like, we mm -hmm. cannot separate the fact that he's a black man from the criticism he's getting. It's valid criticism, but there's people who are going to use it, you know, on this other side to further their racist goals. Because mm -hmm. so, a lot of people mm -hmm. brought yeah. in the fact that Eminem has said so much horrible things towards the oh, yeah, community right. in mm -hmm. the past. And would that, speaking of what we were talking about earlier, would that behavior, would Eminem be able to be Eminem who he was in the past today? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I yeah. Mean, well, he got on the back of Elton John, and I think right. that he immediately tried to learn and tried to educate him. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing with the, the baby is, it's like, I mean, you are coming from it, and as someone who's, who's Black and gay, you are coming from an environment where, you know, homosexuality is very tough in the Black community. It is. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he's coming from that place. Also, mm -hmm. he's coming from and a hurt HIV place. stigma. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in the black community, it's HIV uh -huh. because we've been, I mean, because the black community has been so impacted, the yeah. stigma around HIV is so great still. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you grow up with that, you grow up hearing that, like you internalize it unless you've had an education. That's why it's so important that people like the baby actually get those educations and then share that with the world because people listen, you know? Right. I mean, well, Miley listen. Cyrus, like, tried to reach out to him and was like, hey, like, yeah. I can help you, like, educate you. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I mean, she got hate for doing that. So you never know. It's like, she's like, I like to educate people and, and you know, reach out in love and, and, all, and people were like, yeah, I don't like that either. So, you know. <laughs> it was Miley Cyrus specifically, because I think a lot of people are so upset when she like, you know, came out with all this hip hop music and then mm -hmm. she denounced hip hop and was just like, oh, you know, they appropriate women and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, but you didn't have that conversation when you were making money. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know? And yeah. so I think people are kind of just don't want to hear from and I, and I, and I, and I, and I when think, it comes to black issues or well, like, I think you know with what Miley saying? though specifically to kind of pick it back off of what you were just mm -hmm. saying, I do 100% agree with that. And I think that maybe cover, I think that from Miley, she did another interview recently and she talked about that and she said, the things that I started to see once I was in that community, in that specific hip hop community, is why I spoke out and said what I said. And I'm like, well, your publicist should have did a better job because yeah. you came out all I mean, the time, like, screw the hip hop community. Yeah. Right. And that's not fair. And now, there's a lot of hip hop out there that is not. That is not like that. Exactly. You can speak. Okay. Oh my God. Can I just tell you? So, yeah. Northern Idaho, there's a county fair. Every, every county in Idaho is a county fair, right? That's the highlight of our lives. So, <laughs> Northern, but there's a county fair up in Northern Idaho. Which which is really one of the more liberal parts of the state. And um, there's a huge backlash because they booked a Nelly. And they're like, uh -huh. they're bringing the left, they're like left wing social justice warriors are bringing a rap to our county fairs to indoctrinate our children. <laughs> oh <my laughs> and I'm like, and you know, and to change like, our traditional values. And I'm like, Nelly. You guys are going to the mat to like boycott Nelly, you know? Who is right. still fine to the yeah. day. He's Ooh. doing just right. Right? <laughs> just like, oh my God. Just yeah. so sexy. I can't even. But. I know. I, I know. Right? So another hot topic I actually want to jump in with you about is DeSantis. Now he's acting up, mm -hmm. as you know, um, and apparently he is now threatening to the school funds in Florida oh, if yeah. they require a mask because a lot of the schools are saying, listen, we are going to have to require a mask and Ugh. he's threatening them. And then he's also got this feud going on with President Biden, which is a whole other subject. Yeah. What do you think about DeSantis and why do you think he's just kind of going all to the mat? He's kind of lining up with Marjorie yeah. Taylor Greene at this point. Yeah, I think that's the deal, actually. I think he's going all in. Well, A, he's an idiot. But B, right. I think right. he's going all in on Trumpism and uh, and really trying to get to that base there of, you know, that 33% of like really rabid followers that mm -hmm. will follow you as you, you know, plummet your death off the cliff, you know? So I think that's what he's trying to do. And he's trying to stick with that. And uh, it's against all science. It's against common sense and it's not going to hold up in the courts you know that's going to think um, he's going right. to withhold funds it's going to get to the courts the courts are going to say you know you really don't have the authority to do that um, but he's going to have won his base he's going to have won this is all for show with him i was going to uh, say that's yeah. what i think i mean it's just ridiculous too
The, the, I, just the even the concept. The schools have so little money. The idea that the governor of the state's going to like withhold more of it, you know? Mm -hmm. The teachers already buy half the supplies for the students. My God, you know? So it's ridiculous that they're going to, you know, that, that, he, that, he, that he's even challenging this, but it's not going to hold up in the courts. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're just tired. We're like tired of it. We're right. so tired. Oh my God, yes, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just it's everything every day. Mm. But um, so I want to ask about, um, uh, I think it's called rainbow washing, yeah. right? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a huge. Pink washing thing. or rainbow washing, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just finished Pride uh, season, or well, at least New York did, you know, several Prides throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But New York just finished theirs in June. And it was like as soon as June 30th happened, or and then July 1st, it was like boom, boom. Like we. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Take off the logos. Everybody take the rainbow off your logo. Wash out the sidewalks, you know, right. from their yeah. rainbow yeah. crosswalks. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the thing is with rainbow washing is that it's become profitable. And mm -hmm. so uh, companies want to be seen as doing something. But the deal is we've gone to a new level there. You know, I would tell you in the 80s, if a company had put a rainbow anything out and said, we like gay people, we would have been thrilled. At that point, our only allies were really liquor companies. So Absolute, Stoli, companies like that. Right. Um, yeah you know, that, that had been supporting us, especially in LGBT media, we would not have gay magazines at all if we had not had absolute support for multiple years and stole support oh. now for multiple years. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's a truism. But uh, so in the 90s, basically, you started putting rainbow stuff and saying we like gay people, Macy's was an early one. Um, and we were like, thrilled. Yes, let's support them. Um, as the decades have gone, you know, we've gone so far beyond that. We now want those corporations to treat their employees, their LGBTQ plus employees, um, you know, with equal respect as the rest of the folks and get them their equal rights in the workforce, which is not always a given. We want those companies to do the right thing out in, out in the world. And that's not to, you know, give money to anti LGBTQ politicians, regardless of what your, your cause is um, that you're supporting. And I'll be honest, we, we, you know, we've seen that happen in LGBTQ media. We've seen that happen in, in different spots before and we get, you know, taken to the carpet for it as we should. So I think that, um, so with these corporations, you know, we want them to support us year round you know, pride, queer people, we shop all year round. We're people, it's pride, we always say pride 365 here mm -hmm. at Pride Media. We're pride 365. We're proud today. We're proud all year long. Uh, you don't need to market to us just in June. You know, go ahead and market all year round. Um, right. But make about what, make your marketing thoughtful. Don't just slap a rainbow, you know, right. rainbow on a t shirt right. and, you know, give 5% to a charity. At this point, we're asking you to do more now, you know, that used yeah. to be like the best thing we could imagine. And now people are asking for more. One of the things I love this year was, uh, well, two things actually. And I'm, and I could tell you because they're not clients. Um, so, you know, that I'm being genuine. Um, but so Vans did this creator um, campaign. They took all the money that they would use for the pride campaign and they gave it to five um, LGBTQ creators. And I can't remember if all of them were people of color or many of them were people of color, but either way, they put that money out. They didn't ask anything back on it. They didn't do much to really publicize it. And that was just, that was it, you know? Um, they do have products that, you know, that speak to the, the community or speak to people who like rainbows and, and other things, you know, um, and so they've done queer shoes for sure. But this was like a great way to just amplify those people. So they gave money to those people and then they sh amplified their voices all over the country. And it's so great. And then um, Oreos, you know, supports us year round, right? They're a huge corporation, Mondelez. And, um, but they support us year round and, and they had that video about, um, you know, the girl taking her girlfriend home to her parents and her father being really uncomfortable. And then he ends up painting a, a little picket fence rainbow colors to, to show her he yeah. loves her because 
uh, you know, straight men can't communicate very well. So I think that. <laughs> I don't understand it. It's so hard. One one. And they had the Gaga Oreo, so it was like double pride. They know their <laughs> audience. Right. <laughs> I, I don't really eat Oreos. Wait but for I, June to put out that Gaga Oreo. They put yeah. out that Gaga Oreo in like February. Oreo. So, <laughs> you know, they do queer stuff all year round. So, you know, I love that. And I love Bubbly. We is one of our clients they work that with, but we've done this great. campaign with Bubbly where we've been producing these videos with drag queens and now it's spread all over the country. So it's drag queens in all these cities. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. and they've been, yeah, they look great. Yeah. Mary Cherry, I believe, from Brooklyn is uh, And a lot of New York City nightlife people. Yeah, so we did that whole New York City nightlife campaign. And then we did um, nightlife across the country. And so there's like, we amplified 30 nightlife, 30 LGBTQ nightlife folks, and then did these videos. But we do them for, we did um, Halloween last year. We did holidays last year. You know, so they're not waiting Uh, for you know, June. And so that's, that's how you do it right. right. Well, yeah. Pride, the podcast is available. Next time you guys want to <laughs> yes, shoot, exactly. let us know. Um, <laughs> queer Voices in Media will do it. Thank you. Because I was going to say, our, yeah, one of our new taglines now, because we have brand new merch. Yes, yes. merch. Yeah, so it's Celebrate Pride 365. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. Is that. Our tagline. Listen, yeah. the bubbly campaigns work because I was in the store, and I'm not just saying this, I was in the store the other day, I picked me up some strawberry flavor. It's good. So, yeah. yeah, and I, and I thought about the campaign. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cherry. I to hear. I drink bubbly actually, like, but I, you know, I drank it before they supported us. So, but um, I was at the time, like, when they first. This was a few years ago when we first started working with them, and people were like, "What is that? I've never heard of that." So, I love that they're so visible now, and they've done it in such a queer way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to piggyback off of the whole rainbow washing and see how you feel about the whole queer baiting accusations with like celebrities. Mm. I know that oh. topic recently came well, up. You know, making accusations against Cardi B is ridiculous. Like her right. and Megan, I mean, they're both like bisexual or queer or, you know, right. Cardi B's so, very like, I mean, it's like queer baiting when you are queer, right? right? You know, so, right. um, I, and I don't think it's necessarily, I don't know that it's always queer baiting when you have, um, you know, when you have, let's say non-queer or non-trans folks who, who do, you know, queer affect in positive ways. Like I would say that, you know, Harry Styles gender expression is very queer, even if his orientation isn't. And Mm -hmm. I think him, you know, his gender expression and and wearing nail polish and dresses and stuff, it only helps us. It doesn't hurt us. You know, it just helps us to normalize that that any gender can wear those things and that you can still be a man and want to have your nails done and you know all those kinds right i mean it's just like your nails exactly it's like it that shouldn't define who you are in the same way our genitals don't necessarily define who we are so right i think that i think you know there i think there used to be a lot of lesbian baiting i think a lot of like girl on girl stuff was like yeah titillate men and and you see yeah Mm -hmm. so and you know it when you see it but um but you know i don't think we're seeing that the same way anymore outside of pornography a lot of go- a mm-hmm. lot of straight white males on TikTok have come under a harsh accusations for queer baiting mm-hmm. because they say that they're getting with their friends and they're not really gay, but they take their shirts off and then they get queer money for it. And there was a big discussion on is that yeah. okay to accept oh, that they queer have, dollars? Like, people have two different profiles. Yeah. They have their straight mm-hmm. profile and then the profile where they per- kind of like pretend to be gay. Yeah. Like, they don't yeah. say yeah. I'm gay, oh, wow. but I've they like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is like a whole but whole I'm thing. kind of of the belief that if you pretend to be gay, you know, right? I mean, like our sexual orientation is fluid, right? And right. we know coming out as a path. How many people do you know that were like queer that did something sort of gay, but were like, I'm not gay, right? And then yeah. later on, we're like, oh, honey, you are so gay. And then they're out, yeah. right? I so know. I kind of am wondering how many of those guys are like on that pathway, but are able to like couch it in the like, in the same way. Have you, you ever met like straight guys who are like, you know, I'm straight, but you know, but Have I'm I okay ever. if I get a blowjob from a guy, right? But I will say also, 
It is important for people like Harry Styles to do that because I had a situation in Harlem because I we all well you live uptown and mm-hmm. and I live in Harlem, and someone came up to me and in a kind of aggressive way, but they talked about my nails and then they ended up saying, "I know X Y and Z rapper has nail polish, so you're cool." Like that actually happened, <laughs> and that's that was like wow, like representation and people showing their true identities helps. Yeah, yeah like, like bad bunny. Over. Bad bunny. It's really changing. Uh, I mean. Uh, I love that. I love, I mean, even I, you know, I've given a lot of thought to like how things are changing, how we identify and how, uh, you know, like how that also just how it's okay for us to like, you know, constantly evaluating like what our own identity is and what our gender expression is um, in in a non-fixed way, you know, because I think that in the, in the past it's, it has been very fixed. You're man or woman, you're butch or femme, you're this or that. Right, and, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and if um, you were femme and you were a male, they would automatically be like, you're gay. And, you know, sometimes yeah. it's not the case. And I think that, you know, your comments early about uh, Cardi B and Megan, I think it's so sad. Ashley and I spoke about this at home the other day because that does come from straight white men who, and, and just men in general, who don't take women being lesbian yeah. or queer serious. They're like, oh, they're not lesbian. Like, they're, mm-hmm. that, they're that's hot. They, they literally... It's it's almost yeah. worse of them when they say to gay men, like, oh, if you just get the right woman, you won't be gay. It's almost worse because they literally, I mean, that's how a lot of sexual assaults happen. Most of the yeah, time, yeah. men will see yeah. a woman I mean, it's the whole, who says that. The whole theory, like, my dick will cure you of your sexual orientation. Oh, exactly. right. Right. Yeah. It's just like, I'm pretty sure it's going to get way the opposite there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Gotta, anyways, like, way off it. base. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and the thing, too, is that's used... The sexual assault issue mm-hmm. is an issue here, but it's a huge issue in some other countries. You know, we yeah. know corrective rape in Africa and South Africa, it's used so widely against lesbian women and um, and, and yeah. to, you know, such extremes and such acceptance and stuff. So it's like, we need to be setting, you know, the standard worldwide. Mm-hmm. And- I read a story in Africa that actually came up. It was about a man actually who he was gay and they had women multiple, like rape him multiple oh, times mm-hmm. to try to turn him. I actually read about oh, that wow. today. That so is- it's, Insane. It, it's insane and and it wasn't they didn't classify it as rape there because yeah it was their corrective situation. it's corrective like yeah. yeah and yeah. it's it really crazy like women just going in and out of the room and this person was like it ain't changing over here and they were just like <laughs> right. we're just gonna keep doing this until wow. it does so it's horrible right. but listen before we let you go diane i really want to talk to you something super important about you co-authoring the memoir, Queerly Beloved, um, which Aww. talked about uh, your relationship with your husband through his transition. So can you talk to us and our listeners about that and how that came to be? Sure. Um, so we, um, so like I said, we, we got together 31 years ago, total lesbian U-Haul uh-huh. couple at that time, literally. Had a weekend, moved in together really quickly afterwards. Um, <laughs> I had That's a wife at the time, <laughs> so it was definitely a lesbian, you know, situation because I did have a wife at the time, um, and um, and so you know he moved in with us, um, and that relationship transitioned obviously. Um, so we then were a lesbian couple for 16 years. We were definitely a butch film couple. Um, uh, in in very you know what we think of in very modern terms in in our world um, you know fems are kind of the bosses and so um, you know I literally did not know a fem who was a bottom until I was like forty two and I was like really how's that work <laughs> so um, so I mean you know like we're non traditional in that way to begin with but. Um, we and we had started trying to get our rights as a as a couple ever since then so like the only thing then was like a domestic partnership certificate we could get in west hollywood it was like the only city on one of the two cities on the west coast where it that was legal Mm -hmm. and for most of our lives originally that's what we were fighting for just to get legal domestic partnership in every state you know we wanted it federal so we were fighting that for so many years um and each time we would get like a higher elevation, like the state now has rights and we would get remarried and remarried. And, um, and then uh, I think we'd be 16 years in and I sort of saw it come in like six months before um, Jake was reading, uh, you know, some things from trans kids or uh, some, you know, gender non-binary folks. And he would, essays, cause he was doing a lot of reviews for the women review books. And, and he would say at the time, 
you know, if I were younger, maybe this is how I would identify. Maybe if I were younger, this is what I would do, that kind of stuff. We weren't that old. We were in our 30s. Um, but, um, but we weren't kids. So right. I think, right. so I saw it coming. So by the time he was, you know, ready to tell me he thought he was trans or thought he was a man, um, you know, I was like, okay, let's get into therapy. Let's make sure this is real. Let's get this moving, you know, that kind of thing. So um, when we first were going through our transition, um, I, uh, I had a, a lot of fear because I, um, I was the most powerful person at the world's largest lesbian magazine. And so, you know, and then at the same time, we had already had one of our novels accepted um, through our publisher. So we went both of our publishers, our publisher, Franco Stevens at the magazine and said, hey, do you want us to stay closeted about this? Like, am I going to lose my job? What, you know, we'll do what we have to do. You know, if we, and she was like, you are the best person to run this magazine. You're not going anywhere. And our book publisher, we said, do you want us to keep a pen name, you know, or just use Diane's name? And she was like, at the time they'd never published men. Now they have a whole men's division, but at the time they never published men. And she said, no, let's try it. Let's see, let's see how it goes. You know, you'll be the first man we publish, but let's try it. So um so with their support you know we kind of went out but we noticed that we got all the documentaries we watched the couples always broke up the books that we read the couples broke up like we just kept getting story after story and then the more we were out we would go we at the time we used to go to like 30 pride festivals across the country and we would talk um you know talk to folks and they would always come up and be like oh my god do you um you know i'm afraid to come out i'm afraid to do this what do i do how my girlfriend's gonna leave me my wife's gonna leave me all that stuff so that's why we started decide decided to write the book and write it together and we wrote all our books together except for the last two we each have a solo but um that's why we decided to do that is just write that book because we wanted to show a couple that stayed together that you can like you you transition you both transition your family transitions um it's a joint journey it's so worth it though it's so worth it to see that person become who they have always like struggled to be you know even if they didn't know that's what they've been struggling to find um i i went with this person i did have grief i had a very very foxy wife uh, who was my ideal, tall, blue-eyed, blonde. I had grief all the time, and we went through this period uh, where every time I'd see a man, I'd be like, not that, you know, as a, like, you can't be that kind of a man. You can't be that kind of a man. And I'd see somebody who was very, very hairy everywhere, and I'd be like, oh, God, not that. Please, not that, you know? <laughs> and there was a moment while we were shopping for clothes, because I, I took him to buy a whole new wardrobe, and we were shopping for clothes, and he, had, in exasperation, said, fine, then who? what, you know, who can I be? Mm -hmm. And uh, give me a model. And I thought for a minute, and it's a really weird, but I pulled it out of the air. I was like, Ryan Seacrest. Because he was like, for some reason, came into my mind as somebody who was like, vaguely feminine, kind of gay, but like, <laughs> but, but a man, clearly, you know? Right, and so right. he was like, he was non-inoffensive and, um, you know, still attractive and stuff. But, but I could imagine him with a hairless chest, you know, who knows? So... I, um, so, and he, and he thought, Jake thought for a minute and he goes, okay, I like to do that. So we would buy clothes, we'd pull up blazers and stuff and we'd be like, you know, it was sort of like, uh, you know, what would Ryan do? We'd be like, does this work? Does this work? And that helped us in those beginning stages while Jake was determining who he really was and what kind of man he wanted to be. And, you know, after a year, none of that mattered. Of course, he was his own man and he continues to grow into you know, it continues to grow into manhood and um, in, well, Jacob, in this okay, very beautiful handsome, way. And I think that very much better than Ryan Seacrest uh, <laughs> could have ever thought to be. And, you know, if Ryan leaves Kelly, Jacob has a job. So just put him on over there. <laughs> <laughs> there <you go. laughs> I love it. Well, listen, Diane, thank you so much for joining us uh, today. It yes. has meant so much. It's been so inspiring to really hear you talk about everything that you've done and will continue to do. So tell our listeners where they can find you on social media. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram, which is a hodgepodge, but it's under quirky girls. And then on Twitter, I'm delicious Diane, even though I didn't tweet very much just because I, I'm not very good with rage tweets, but um, <laughs> I think that's where you can find me. So, and then, you know, read my magazine out the advocate plus and out traveler and pride.com. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me, y'all. That is it's so great to chat with y'all. No, yeah, this has been you. amazing. Yeah. So fabulous. Like, I love honor. hearing your insight yeah. on everything. Aww. 
Thanks, Ashley. That means a lot. Yeah, yeah. such a great point of view. <laughs> Thank you. And Diane, listen, come back with us anytime. We Please. love to discuss yes, hot, hot topics topic. and everything here. So we can have you back anytime and we will just go down the list because you know, people in Hollywood ain't bathing now, apparently. There's a lot going on. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> we'd love to have you back. Yeah. I love it. Call me anytime. Thanks, Thank y'all. Bye, Diane. Bye, Thank Diane. You so much. Bye. Bye.